Chapter 4 A Psychological Theory of Types Character is the fixed individual form of a human being. Since there is a form of body as well as of behavior or mind, a general characterology must teach the significance of both physical and psychic features. The enigmatic oneness of the living being has as its necessary corollary the fact that bodily traits are not merely physical, nor mental traits merely psychic. The continuity of nature knows nothing of those antithetical distinctions, which the human intellect is forced to set up as helps to understanding. The distinction between mind and body is an artificial dichotomy, a discrimination which is unquestionably based far more on the peculiarity of intellectual understanding than on the nature of things. In fact, so intimate is the intermingling of bodily and psychic traits that not only can we draw far-reaching inferences as to the constitution of the psyche from the constitution of the body, but we can also infer from psychic peculiarities the corresponding bodily characteristics. It is true that the latter process is more difficult, but this is surely not because there is a greater influence of the body over the mind than vice versa, but for quite another reason. In taking the mind as our starting point, we work our way from the relatively unknown to the known, while in the opposite case, we have the advantage of starting from something known, that is, from the visible body. Despite all the psychology we think we possess today, the psyche is still infinitely more obscure to us than the visible surface of the body. The psyche is still a foreign, almost unexplored country of which we have only indirect knowledge. It is mediated by conscious functions that are subject to almost endless possibilities of deception. This being so, it appears safer for us to proceed from the outer world inward, from the known to the unknown, from the body to the mind. Therefore, all attempts at characterology have started from the outside world. Astrology in ancient times turned even to stellar space in order to determine those lines of fate whose beginnings are contained in man himself. To the same class of interpretations from outward signs belong palmistry, Gaul's phrenology, Levator's study of physiognomy, and more recently, graphology, Kretschmer's physiological study of types, and Rorschach's clexographic method. As we can see, there are any number of paths leading from without inward, from the physical to the psychic, and it is necessary that research should follow this direction until certain elementary psychic facts are established with sufficient certainty. But once having established these facts, we can reverse the procedure. We can then put the question, what are the bodily correlatives of a given psychic condition? Unfortunately, we are not yet far enough advanced to answer this question even roughly. The first requirement is to establish the primary facts of psychic life and this has by no means as yet been accomplished. Indeed, we have only just begun the work of compiling an inventory of the psyche, and our results have not always been successful. Merely to establish the fact that certain people have this or that appearance is of no significance if it does not allow us to infer a psychic correlative. We have learned something only when we have determined what mental attributes go with a given bodily constitution. The body means as little to us without the psyche as the latter without the body. When we try to derive a psychic correlative from a physical characteristic, we are proceeding, as already stated, from the known to the unknown. I must unfortunately stress this point, since psychology is the youngest of all the sciences, and therefore the one that suffers most from preconceived opinions. The fact that we have only recently discovered psychology shows plainly enough that it has taken us all this time to make a clear distinction between ourselves and the contents of our minds. Until this could be done, it was impossible to study the psyche objectively. Psychology as a natural science is actually our most recent acquisition. Up to now, it has been just as fantastic and arbitrary as was natural science in the Middle Ages. Heretofore, it has been thought that psychology could dispense with empirical data and be created as it were by decree, a prejudice under which we are still laboring. Yet the events of psychic life are what is most immediate to us and apparently what we know most about. Indeed, 
they are more than familiar to us, we yawn over them. We are amazed at the banality of these everlasting commonplaces. In short, we actually suffer under the immediacy of our psychic life and do everything in our power to avoid thinking about it. The psyche, then, being immediacy itself, and we ourselves being the psyche, we are almost forced to assume that we know it through and through in a way that cannot be questioned. This is why each of us has his own private opinion about psychology and is even convinced that he knows more about it than anyone else. Psychiatrists, because they must struggle with their patients' families and guardians whose understanding is proverbial, are perhaps the first as a professional group to become aware of that blind prejudice which encourages every man to take himself as his own best authority in psychological matters. But this, of course, does not prevent the psychiatrist also from becoming a know-all. One of them went so far as to confess, There are only two normal people in the city. Professor B is the other. Since this is how matters stand in psychology today, we must admit that what is closest to us is the very thing we know least about, although it seems to be what we know best of all. Furthermore, we must admit that everyone else probably understands us better than we do ourselves. At any rate, as a starting point, this would be a most useful heuristic principle. As I have said, it is just because the psyche is so close to us that psychology has been discovered so late. Being still in its initial stages as a science, we lack the concepts and definitions with which to grasp the facts. If concepts are lacking to us, facts are not. On the contrary, we are surrounded, almost buried, by these facts. This is a striking contrast to the state of affairs in other sciences, where the facts have first to be unearthed. Here, the classification of primary data results in the formation of descriptive concepts covering certain natural orders, as, for example, the grouping of the elements in chemistry, and of genera and botany. But it is quite different in the case of the psyche. Here, an empirical and descriptive standpoint leaves us at the mercy of the unchecked stream of our own subjective experiences, so that whenever any sort of inclusive generalization emerges from this welter of impressions, it is usually nothing more than a symptom. Because we ourselves are psyches, it is almost impossible for us to give free rein to psychic happenings without being practically dissolved in them and thus robbed of our ability to recognize distinctions and to make comparisons. This is one difficulty. The other lies in the circumstance that the more we turn from special phenomena and come to deal with the spaceless psyche, the more impossible it becomes to determine anything by exact measurement. It becomes difficult even to establish facts. If, for example, I want to emphasize the unreality of something, I say that I merely thought it. I say, I would never even have had this thought unless so-and-so had happened. And besides, I never think things like that. Remarks of this kind are quite usual and show how nebulous psychic facts are, or rather how vague they are on the subjective side. In reality, they are just as objective and as definite as historical events. The truth is that I actually did think thus and thus, regardless of the conditions and stipulations I may attach to this fact. Many people have to wrestle with themselves in order to make this perfectly obvious admission, and it often costs them a great moral effort. These, then, are the difficulties we encounter when we draw inferences about the state of affairs in the psyche from the things we observe outside. Now, my more limited field of work is not the clinical determination of external characteristics, but the investigation and classification of the psychic data which can be inferred from them. The first result of this work is a descriptive study of the psyche, which enables us to formulate certain theories about its structure. From the empirical application of these theories, there is finally developed a conception of psychological types. Clinical studies are based upon the description of symptoms, and the step from this to the descriptive study of the psyche is comparable to the step from a purely symptomatic pathology to the pathology of the cell and of metabolism. That is to say that the descriptive study of the psyche brings into view those psychic processes in the hinterland of the mind which produce the clinical symptoms. As we know, this insight is gained by the application of analytical methods, 
We have today a substantial knowledge of those psychic processes which produce the neurotic symptoms, for our descriptive study of the psyche has advanced far enough to enable us to determine the complexes. Whatever else may be taking place within the obscure recesses of the psyche, and there are notoriously many opinions as to this matter, one thing is certain. It is first and foremost the so-called complexes, emotionally toned contents having a certain amount of autonomy, which play an important part there. The expression, autonomous complex, has often met with opposition, although, as it seems to me, unjustifiably. The active contents of the unconscious do behave in a way I cannot describe better than by the word autonomous. The term is used to indicate the fact that the complexes offer resistance to the conscious intentions and come and go as they please. According to our best knowledge about them, complexes are psychic contents which are outside the control of the conscious mind. They have been split off from consciousness and lead a separate existence in the unconscious, being at all times ready to hinder or to reinforce the conscious intentions. A further study of the complexes leads inevitably to the problem of their origin, and as to this a number of different theories are current. Apart from theories, experience shows us that complexes always contain something like a conflict. They are either the cause or the effect of a conflict. At any rate, the characteristics of conflict, that is, shock, upheaval, mental agony, inner strife, are peculiar to the complexes. They have been called in French, bête noire, while we refer to them as skeletons in the cupboard. They are vulnerable points, which we do not like to remember and still less to be reminded of by others, but which frequently come back to mind, unbidden and in the most unwelcome fashion. They always contain memories, wishes, fears, duties, needs, or views, with which we have never really come to terms, and for this reason they constantly interfere with our conscious life in a disturbing and usually a harmful way. Complexes obviously represent a kind of inferiority in the broadest sense, a statement I must at once qualify by saying that to have complexes does not necessarily indicate inferiority. It only means that something incompatible, unassimilated, and conflicting exists, perhaps as an obstacle, but also as a stimulus to greater effort, and so, perhaps, as an opening to new possibilities of achievement. Complexes are therefore, in this sense, focal or nodal points of psychic life, which we would not wish to do without. Indeed, they must not be lacking, for otherwise psychic activity would come to a fatal standstill but they indicate the unresolved problems of the individual, the points at which he has suffered a defeat, at least for the time being, and where there is something he cannot evade or overcome, his weak spots in every sense of the word. Now these characteristics of the complex throw a significant light on its genesis. It obviously arises from the clash between a requirement of adaptation and the individual's constitutional inability to meet the challenge. Seen in this light, the complex is a symptom which helps us to diagnose an individual disposition. Experience shows us that complexes are infinitely varied, yet careful comparison reveals a relatively small number of typical primary patterns, all of which have their origins in the first experiences of childhood. This must necessarily be so, because the individual disposition is already a factor in childhood. It is innate and not acquired in the course of life. The parental complex is therefore nothing but the first manifestation of a clash between reality and the individual's constitutional inability to meet the requirements it demands of him. The first form of the complex cannot be other than a parental complex, because the parents are the first reality with which the child comes into conflict. The existence of a parental complex therefore tells us little or nothing about the peculiar constitution of the individual. Practical experience soon teaches us that the crux of the matter does not lie in the presence of a parental complex, but rather in the special way in which the complex works itself out in the life of the individual. As to this, we observe the most striking variations, and only a very small number can be attributed to the special traits of parental influence. There are often several children who are exposed to the same influence, and yet each reacts to it in a totally different way.
I have turned my attention to these very differences because I believe that it is through them that specifically individual dispositions can be recognized. Why, in an erotic family, does one child react with hysteria, another with a compulsion neurosis, the third with a psychosis, and the fourth apparently not at all? This problem of the choice of the neurosis, with which Freud also was confronted, robs the parental complex as such of all etiological meaning and shifts the enquiry to the reacting individual and his special disposition. Although Freud's attempts to solve this problem leave me entirely unsatisfied, I am myself unable to answer the question. Indeed, I think the time is not yet right for raising this question of the choice of the neurosis. Before we take up this extremely difficult problem, we must know a great deal more about the way in which the individual reacts. The question is, how does a person react to an obstacle? For instance, we come to a brook where there is no bridge. The stream is too broad to step across, and we must jump. To make this possible, we have at our disposal a complicated functional system, namely the psychomotor system. It is completely developed and needs only to be released, but before this happens, something of a purely psychic nature takes place, that is, the decision is made about what is to be done. This is followed by activities which settle the issue in some way and are different for each individual. But significantly enough, we rarely, if ever, recognize these events as characteristic, for we cannot, as a rule, see ourselves at all, or only at the very end. This is to say that, just as the psychomotor apparatus is automatically at our disposal, so there is an exclusively psychic apparatus ready for our use in the making of decisions, which works also by habit and therefore unconsciously. Opinions differ very widely as to what this apparatus is like. It is certain only that every individual has his accustomed way of meeting decisions and of dealing with difficulties. One person will say he jumped the brook for the fun of the thing, another that it was because there was no alternative, a third that every obstacle he meets challenges him to overcome it, a fourth person did not jump the brook because he hates useless effort, and a fifth refrained because he saw no urgent necessity for crossing to the other side. I have purposely chosen this commonplace example in order to show how irrelevant these incentives seem. They appear so futile indeed that we push them all to one side and are inclined to substitute our own explanation. And yet it is just these variants that furnish us with valuable insight into the individual systems of psychic adaptation. If we examine, in other situations of life, the person who crossed the brook because it gave him pleasure to jump, we shall probably find that for the most part what he does and omits to do can be explained in terms of the pleasure it gives him. We shall observe that the one who sees no other means of getting across goes through life carefully but unwillingly, always making reluctant decisions. In all these cases, special psychic systems are in readiness to carry out decisions offhand. We can easily imagine that the number of these attitudes is legion. The particular variations are certainly as innumerable as the variations of crystals which nevertheless may be recognized as belonging to one or another system. But just as crystals show basic uniformities which are relatively simple, so do these personal attitudes show certain fundamental traits which allow us to assign them to definite groups. Since the earliest times, attempts have repeatedly been made to classify individuals according to types and thus to bring order into what was confusion. The oldest attempt of this sort known to us was made by Oriental astrologers who devised the so-called trigons of the four elements air, water, earth, and fire. The trigon of the air, as it appears in a horoscope, consists of the three aerial signs of the zodiac, Aquarius, Gemini, and Libra. The trigon of fire is made up of Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. According to this age-old view, whoever is born in these trigons shares in their aerial or fiery nature and reveals a corresponding disposition and destiny. This ancient cosmological scheme is the parent of the physiological type theory of antiquity, according to which the four dispositions correspond to the four humors of the body. What was first represented by the signs of the zodiac was later expressed in the physiological terms of Greek medicine, 
giving us the classification into phlegmatic, sanguine, choleric, and melancholic. These are merely terms for the supposed humors of the body. As is well known, this classification lasted nearly 17 centuries. As for the astrological type theory, to the astonishment of the enlightened, it remains intact today and is even enjoying a new vogue. This historical retrospect may set our minds at rest as to the fact that our modern efforts to formulate a theory of types are by no means new and unprecedented, even if our scientific conscience no longer permits us to revert to these old intuitive ways of handling the question. We must find our own answer to this problem, an answer which satisfies the demands of science. And here we meet the chief difficulty of the problem of types, that is, the question of standards or criteria. The astrological criterion was simple. It was given by the constellations. As to the way in which the elements of human character could be ascribed to the zodiacal signs and the planets, this is a question which reaches back into the gray mists of prehistory and remains unanswerable. The Greek classification according to the four physiological dispositions took as its criteria the appearance and behavior of the individual, exactly as is done today in the case of modern physiological types. But where shall we seek our criterion for a psychological theory of types? Let us return to the previously mentioned instance of the various individuals who had to cross a brook. How and from what standpoint should we classify their habitual incentives? One person does it from pleasure, another acts because not to act is more troublesome. A third does not act because he has second thoughts, and so forth. The list of possibilities seems both endless and useless for purposes of classification. I do not know how other people would set about the task. I can therefore only tell you how I myself have approached the matter. And I must submit to the reproach that my way of solving the problem is the outcome of my individual prejudice. Indeed, this objection is so entirely true that I should not know how to meet it. I might perhaps content myself by referring to Columbus, who, by using subjective assumptions, a false hypothesis, and a route abandoned by modern navigation, nevertheless discovered America. Whatever we look at, and however we look at it, we see only through our own eyes. For this reason, a science is never made by one man, but by many. The individual merely offers his contribution, and in this sense, only do I dare to speak of my way of seeing things. My profession has always forced me to take account of the peculiarities of individuals. This has made it necessary for me to establish certain average truths, as also has the circumstance that in the course of many years I have had to treat innumerable married couples and have been faced with the task of making the standpoints of husband and wife mutually plausible. How many times, for example, have I not had to say, Look here, your wife has a very active nature, and it cannot be expected that her whole existence should center around housekeeping. This is the beginning of a type theory, a sort of statistical truth. There are active natures and passive ones, but this time-worn truth did not satisfy me. Therefore, I next tried to say that there were some persons given to reflection, and others who were unreflective because I had observed that apparently passive natures are in reality not so much passive as given to forethought. They first consider a situation and then act, and because they do this habitually, they miss opportunities where immediate action without forethought is called for, thus coming to be stigmatized as passive. The persons who did not reflect always seemed to me to jump into a situation without any forethought, only perhaps to observe afterwards that they had landed in a swamp. Thus, they could be considered unreflective, and this seemed a more appropriate designation than active. Forethought is in certain cases a very important form of activity, just as it is a reasonable course of action in contrast to the effervescence of the person who must act at once at all costs. But I very soon discovered that the hesitation of the one was by no means always forethought, and that the quick action of the other was not necessarily want of reflection. The hesitation of the former often arises from habitual timidity, or at least from something like a customary shrinking backward, as if faced with too heavy a task. 
while the immediate activity of the second is frequently made possible by a predominating self-confidence with respect to the object. This observation caused me to formulate these typical distinctions in the following way. There is a whole class of men who at the moment of reaction to a given situation at first draw back a little as if with an unvoiced no, and only after that are able to react. And there is another class who, in the same situation, come forward with an immediate reaction, apparently confident that their behavior is obviously right. The former class would therefore be characterized by a certain negative relation to the object, and the latter by a positive one. As we know, the former class corresponds to the introverted and the second to the extroverted attitude. But with these two terms in themselves as little is gained as when Molière's bourgeois gentilhomme discovered that he ordinarily spoke in prose. These distinctions attain meaning and value only when we realize all the other characteristics that go with the type. One cannot be introverted or extroverted without being so in every respect. By the term introverted, we mean that all psychic happenings take place in the way we posit as true of introverted people. Thus also, to establish the fact that a certain individual is extroverted would be as irrelevant as proving that his height is six feet, or that he has brown hair, or is brachycephalic. These statements bring little more to light than the bare facts they express, but the expression extroverted claims to have more meaning. It states that, when a person is extroverted, his consciousness, as well as his unconscious, have definite qualities, that his general behavior, his relation to people, and even the course of his life show certain typical characteristics. Introversion or extroversion, as a typical attitude, means an essential bias which conditions the whole psychic process, establishes the habitual reactions, and thus determines not only the style of behavior, but also the nature of subjective experience. And not only so, but it also denotes the kind of compensatory activity of the unconscious which we may expect to find. When the habitual reactions are determined, we can feel fairly certain of having hit the mark, because they govern external behavior on the one hand, and on the other mold specific experience. A certain kind of behavior brings corresponding results, and the subjective understanding of these results gives rise to the experiences, which in turn influence behavior, and thus close the circle of an individual's destiny. Although there need be no doubt that with the habitual reactions we touch upon a decisive matter, there remains the delicate question as to whether we have satisfactorily characterized them. There can be an honest difference of opinion about this even among persons with an equally intimate knowledge of the special field. In my book on types, I have gathered together all that I could find in support of my conception, but I have made it very clear that I do not hold mine to be the only true or possible type theory. This theory is simple enough, consisting as it does in the contrast between introversion and extroversion. But simple formulations are unfortunately most open to doubt. They all too easily cover up the actual complexities and so deceive us. I speak here from my own experience, for scarcely had I published the first formulation of my criteria when I discovered to my dismay that somehow or other I had been taken in by it. Something was out of gear. I tried to explain too much in too simple a way, as often happens in the first joy of discovery. What struck me now was the undeniable fact that while people may be classed as introverts or extroverts, these distinctions do not cover all the dissimilarities between the individuals in either class. So great indeed are these differences that I was forced to doubt whether I had observed correctly in the first place. It took nearly ten years of observation and comparison to clear up this doubt. The question as to the great variation observable among the members of each class entangled me in unforeseen difficulties, which for a long time I could not master. To observe and recognize the differences gave me comparatively little trouble, the root of my difficulties being now, as before, the problem of criteria. How was I to find the right terms for the characteristic differences? Here I realized for the first time, and to the full extent, how young psychology really is. It is still little more than a chaos of arbitrary opinions, the better part of which 
seems to have been produced in the study and consulting room by spontaneous generation from the isolated and therefore Jovian brains of learned scholars. Without wishing to be irreverent, I cannot refrain from confronting the professor of psychology with the mentality of women, of the Chinese, of the Australian Negroes. Our psychology must embrace all life, otherwise we simply remain enclosed in the Middle Ages. I have realized that no sound criteria are to be found in the chaos of contemporary psychology. They have first to be made, not out of whole cloth, of course, but on the basis of the invaluable preparatory work done by many men whose names no history of psychology will pass over in silence. Within the limits of an essay, I cannot possibly mention all the separate observations that led me to pick out certain psychic functions as criteria for the designation of the differences under discussion. I wish only to show how they appear to me as far as I have been able to grasp them. We must realize that an introvert does not simply draw back and hesitate before the object, but that he does so in a very definite way. Moreover, he does not behave in all respects like every other introvert but in a particular manner. Just as the lion strikes down his enemy or his prey with his forepaw, in which his strength resides, and not with his tail like the crocodile, so our habitual reactions are normally characterized by the application of our most trustworthy and efficient function. It is an expression of our strengths. However, this does not prevent our reacting occasionally in a way that reveals our specific weakness. The predominance of a function leads us to construct or to seek out certain situations while we avoid others, and therefore to have experiences that are peculiar to us and different from those of other people. An intelligent man will make his adaptation to the world through his intelligence, and not in the manner of a sixth-rate pugilist, even though now and then, in a fit of rage, he may make use of his fists. In the struggle for existence and adaptation, everyone instinctively uses his most developed function, which thus becomes the criterion of his habitual reactions. The question now becomes, how is it possible to subsume all these functions under general concepts so that they can be distinguished in the welter of merely contingent events? In social life, a rough grouping of this sort has long ago come about, and as a result, we have types like the peasant, the worker, the artist, the scholar, the warrior, and so forth down the list of various professions. But this sort of typification has very little to do with psychology because, as a well-known scholar has maliciously remarked, there are savants who are merely intellectual porters. A type theory must be more subtle. It is not enough, for example, to speak of intelligence, for this is too general and too vague a concept. Almost any behavior can be called intelligent if it works smoothly, quickly, effectively, and to a purpose. Intelligence, like stupidity, is not a function but a modality. The term tells us nothing more than how a function works. The same holds true of moral and aesthetic criteria. We must be able to designate what it is that functions outstandingly in the individual's habitual way of reacting. We are thus forced to resort to something which, at first glance, alarmingly resembles the old faculty psychology of the 18th century. In reality, however, we are only returning to current ideas in daily speech, perfectly accessible and comprehensible to everyone. When, for instance, I speak of thinking, it is only the philosopher who does not know what I mean. No layman will find it incomprehensible. He uses this word every day and always in the same general sense. Though it is true enough that he is not a little embarrassed if he is called upon suddenly to give an unequivocal definition of thinking. The same is true of memory or feeling, however difficult it is to define such notions scientifically, and thus make of them psychological concepts, they are easily intelligible in current speech. Speech is a storehouse of images founded on experience, and therefore concepts which are too abstract do not easily take root in it, or quickly die out again for lack of contact with reality. But thinking and feeling are so obtrusively real that every language above the primitive level has absolutely unmistakable expressions for them. We can therefore be sure that these expressions coincide with perfectly definite psychic facts, no matter what the scientific definitions of these complex facts may be. Everyone knows, for example, 
what consciousness is, and nobody doubts that the concept covers a definite psychic condition, however far science may be from defining it satisfactorily. So it came about that I simply formed my concepts of the psychic functions from the notions expressed in current speech, and used them as my criteria in judging the differences between persons of the same attitude type. For example, I took thinking as it is generally understood because I was struck by the fact that many persons habitually do more thinking than others, and accordingly give more weight to thought when making important decisions. They also use their thinking in trying to understand and adapt themselves to the world, and whatever happens to them is subjected to consideration and reflection, or at least reconciled with some principle sanctioned by thought. Other people conspicuously neglect thinking in favor of emotional factors, that is, feeling. They inveterately follow a policy dictated by feeling, and it takes an extraordinary situation to make them reflect. These persons exhibit a striking and unmistakable contrast to the former. This difference is most patent when, for example, a person of one kind is the partner in business or marriage of a person of the other kind. Now, a man may give preference to thinking whether he be extroverted or introverted, but he always uses it in the way that is characteristic of his attitude type. However, the predominance of one or the other of these functions does not explain all the differences to be found. What I call the thinking or feeling types embrace two groups of persons who again have something in common which I cannot designate except by the word rationality. No one will dispute the statement that thinking is essentially rational, but when we come to feeling, certain objections may be raised, which I do not want simply to overrule. On the contrary, I freely admit that this problem of feeling has been one over which I have racked my brains. Yet, not to burden this essay with the various existing definitions of this concept, I shall confine myself briefly to my own view. The chief difficulty lies in the fact that the word feeling. Can be applied in all sorts of different ways. This is especially true in the German language, but is noticeable to some extent in English and French as well. First of all, then, we must make a careful distinction between the concepts of feeling and sensation. The latter being taken to cover the sensory processes, and in the second place, we must recognize that a feeling of regret is something quite different from a feeling that the weather will change or that the price of aluminum shares will go up. I have therefore proposed using the term feeling in the first instance and dropping it, so far as psychological terminology is concerned, in the other two instances. Here we should speak of sensation when the sense organs are involved. And of intuition, if we are dealing with the kind of perception which cannot be traced directly to conscious sensory experience, I have therefore defined sensation as perception through conscious sensory processes, and intuition as perception by way of unconscious contents and connections. Obviously, we can argue until doomsday about the fitness of these definitions, but the discussion eventually turns upon a mere question of terms. It is as if. We debated whether to call a certain animal a puma or a mountain lion. When all that is needed is to know what we wish to designate in a given way. Psychology is an unexplored field of study, and its particular idiom must first be fixed. It is well known that temperature can be measured according to Reaumur, Celsius, or Fahrenheit, but we must indicate which system we are using. It is evident then. That I take feeling as a function in itself and distinguish it from sensation and intuition. Whoever confuses these last two functions with feeling in the narrower sense can obviously not acknowledge the rationality of feeling. But if they are separated from feeling, it becomes quite clear that feeling values and feeling judgments—that is to say, our feelings—are not only reasonable but are also as discriminating, logical, and consistent as thinking. Such a statement seems strange to a man of the thinking type, but we can understand this when we realize that in a person with a differentiated thinking function, the feeling function is always less developed, more primitive, and therefore contaminated with other functions. These being precisely the functions which are not rational, not logical, and not evaluating, namely sensation and intuition. These two last are, by their very nature, opposed to the rational functions. When we think, 
It is in order to judge or to reach a conclusion, and when we feel, it is in order to attach a proper value to something. Sensation and intuition, on the other hand, are perceptive. They make us aware of what is happening, but do not interpret or evaluate it. They do not act selectively according to principles, but are simply receptive of what happens. But what happens is merely nature, and therefore essentially non-rational. There are no modes of inference by which it can be proved that there must be so many planets, or so many species of warm-blooded animals of this or that sort. Lack of rationality is a vice where thinking and feeling are called for. Rationality is a vice where sensation and intuition should be trusted. Now, there are many persons whose habitual reactions are non-rational, because they are based chiefly upon sensation or intuition. They cannot be based upon both at once, because sensation is just as antagonistic to intuition as thinking is to feeling. When I try to assure myself with my eyes and ears of what actually occurs, I cannot at the same time give way to dreams and fantasies as to what lies around the corner. As this is just what the intuitive type must do in order to give free play to the unconscious or to the object, it is easy to see that the sensation type is at the opposite pole to the intuitive. Unfortunately, I cannot here take up the interesting variations which the extroverted or introverted attitude produces in non-rational types. Instead, I prefer to add a word about the effects regularly produced upon the other functions when preference is given to one. We know that a man can never be everything at once, never complete. He always develops certain qualities at the expense of others, and wholeness is never attained. But what happens to those functions which are not developed by exercise? and not consciously brought into daily use. They remain in a more or less primitive and infantile state, often only half conscious or even quite unconscious. These relatively undeveloped functions constitute a specific inferiority which is characteristic of each type and is an integral part of the total character. The one-sided emphasis on thinking is always accompanied by an inferiority in feeling, and differentiated sensation and intuition are mutually injurious. Whether a function is differentiated or not may easily be recognized from its strength, stability, constancy, trustworthiness, and service in adaptedness. But inferiority in a function is often not so easily described or recognized. An essential criterion is its lack of self-sufficiency and our resulting dependence on people and circumstances. Furthermore, it's disposing us to moods and undue sensitivity, its untrustworthiness and vagueness, and its tendency to make us suggestible. We are always at a disadvantage in using the inferior function because we cannot direct it, being in fact even its victims. Since I must restrict myself here to a mere sketch of the basic ideas of a psychological theory of types, I must unfortunately forego a detailed description of individual traits and actions in the light of this theory. The total result of my work in this field up to the present is the presentation of two general types covering the attitudes which I call extroversion and introversion. Besides these, I have worked out a fourfold classification corresponding to the functions of thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. Each of these functions varies according to the general attitude, and thus eight variants are produced. I have been asked, almost reproachfully, why I speak of four functions and not of more or fewer. That there are exactly four is a matter of empirical fact. But as the following consideration will show, a certain completeness is attained by these four. Sensation establishes what is actually given. Thinking enables us to recognize its meaning. Feeling tells us its value, and, finally, intuition points to the possibilities of the whence and whither that lie within the immediate facts. In this way, we can orientate ourselves with respect to the immediate world as completely as when we locate a place geographically by latitude and longitude. The four functions are somewhat like the four points of the compass. They are just as arbitrary and just as indispensable. Nothing prevents our shifting the cardinal points as many degrees as we like in one direction or the other. Nor are we precluded from giving them different names. It is merely a question of convention and comprehensibility. But one thing I must confess, 
I would not for anything dispense with this compass on my psychological journeys of discovery. This is not merely for the obvious, all too human reason that everyone is in love with his own ideas. I value the type theory for the objective reason that it offers a system of comparison and orientation which makes possible.